Um, hello. Uh, Welcome to how tear gas has been used to suppress dissent. Uh, this is an exciting uh, roundtable. I'm very, very uh, happy to be moderating. My name's Ajay Singh Chaudhary. Um, we are largely uh, celebrating the release of Anna uh, Feigenbaum's book, uh, Tear Gas, which I just finished reading this afternoon. Uh, and it is fantastic, and so you should check it out. Um, just briefly, uh, everyone here, Anna's here, uh, to, she'll speak first. Um, Mark Bray is here, and I'll give everyone's longer bio that fits on amazing things, and you'll hear about it in a moment. Um, then uh, Ellie Issa will speak, and then finally uh, L.A. Kaufman. And then we'll do a little bit of t talking to each other. And then, of course, you all should feel free and keep in mind some ideas and comments and questions that you want to participate and share. So without further ado, Anna Feigenbaum is co-author of the book Protest Camps, and her work has appeared in Vice, The Atlantic, Al Jazeera America, The Guardian, Salon, Financial Times, Open Democracy, I mean, it's really a lot of great places. Open Democracy, New Internationalist, and Waging Nonviolence. She is senior lecturer in the Faculty of Media and Communication at Bournemouth University. Her website is, is AnnaFagenbaum.com. Uh, follow her on Twitter, and I, I won't try to pronounce this, but follow her on Twitter at, at Dr. Figtree. Yeah? The tear gases appear to be admirably suited to the purpose of isolating the individual from the mob spirit. He is thrown into a condition in which he can think of nothing but relieving his own distress. Under such conditions, an army disintegrates and a mob ceases to be. It becomes a blind stampede to get away from the source of torture. Nobody can travel very fast in a narrow street or in the midst of obstacles with streams of burning tears flowing from his eyes. An advantage of the milder form of gas weapons in dealing with a mob is that the responsible officer need not hesitate to use his weapons. Sure. So it's going to open with that slightly jarring, um, <laughs> which we think is a reenactment and not an actual uh, archival footage that the BBC put together the other week. Um, and I wanted to do that to just kind of set the tone, because it's really important to me that this, this is an archival piece of work. And so what I'm going to do today is just share a few little snippets from the archives that made its way into the, into the book um, to kind of pull out some of the key things that I was trying to do with this um, as a book um, in a very short amount of time. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of reading and a little bit of talking to you, um, so, yeah. The archives are often far more honest than the present. Stripped of a hundred years of public relations expertise, we can see what riot control looked like in its raw form. Napin, so who we just heard, was one of the men enlisted by General Amos Fries, leader of the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service after the First World War, who, when the war ended, donated samples of war gases to his friends who had begun entrepreneurial pursuits as corporate manufacturers of early tear gas for law enforcement purposes. So basically the First World War ends. Uh, this general, among other people, really wanted to keep chemical warfare afloat. It has to do with lots of reasons. Quickly, the US came into the war quite late. 10% of all chemists were enlisted into the US war effort. And so they wanted to keep their jobs. They wanted to keep this big, exciting research and development plant that they had built. And they also wanted to make money, and they saw an opportunity. And so not just tear gas, lots and lots of things, including like the gas chamber, came out of this looking for peacetime uses of these wartime gases. And so this general, being uh, a very, very bright man, as my graduate, uh, got, got a bunch of his buddies to start tear gas businesses and basically borrowed some samples from the military labs and donated them to these guys who then figured out how to commercially manufactured tear gas, and so that is the birth of a commercial market in tear gas, which begins in the U.S. in this post-World uh, War I era. And so General Fries enlists his buddies in this effort, lawyers, publicists, journalists, and they hosted these dramatic exhibitions, and this is at the same time as Bernays is in the birth of PR, and so they're doing these big kind of expos where you display a product like the like World Fair style. And and so they would get about 200 cops in a big yard of gas, and they'd just tear gas them all, and they would take photos of it, and then they would show you know, how amazing the mob stampede to get away from the source of torture, as we heard, was. And so you had these massive demonstrations to kind of exhibit this. Um, and so the, when they started to get taken up by law enforcement, it was largely to crush the rising labor union labor demonstrations and movements that were coming out of the Great Depression, 
in the, in the US context. And so you had a lot of organizing that was really starting to threaten the state. And you had a lot of particularly important, for what I want to talk about today, is uh, industrialists. So people who had their businesses and their workers were on strike and they did not want to lose money and they did not want to lose control of their workers. And so tear gas was a great remedy to the problem of labor unrest in the 1920s and 1930s. And generally, I'm most surprised, importantly, particularly since we have Mark here today to talk to us, uh, was hellbent on destroying migrants and communists. He was beloved by many on the far right at the time, and he held particularly esteem with the Ku Klux Klan. So I'm going to read a little bit from his uh, testifying. In 1935, he testifies to Congress and he says, there is no room in this country for any ism or any word ending in those letters except Americanism. Make America great again. <laughs> Fry's militarized white supremacist vision saw the duty of a true American, in his words, as, quote, the protection of our country against any foreign dangers whatsoever, whether it is from aliens outside or not. <laughs> so in planning for this panel, I wrote to the others here that my hope with this book was to put to put it crudely, was to show how both colonialism and capitalism are entangled at the heart of the history of riot control technologies. With this in mind, I would like to speak briefly on each of these two threads and, and kind of just show you how I weave them together in the book. So to begin with, colonialism. So uh, I'm going to start with European colonialism and then talk for a moment about settler colonialism. So in European colonialism con context, so we've got the 1920s, the US is using this stuff, we're crushing labor, protesters, South Africa's using it, some of the other European countries are using it too. Um, I just tell the story through kind of US uh, history, history. So the success that they're having with quelling the social unrest gets Imperial Britain, because of course like Britain has occupied like you know, a huge, huge amount of the world at this point in time, and Britain is, and the independence movements are starting, and Britain starts, control is starting to slip away from its kind of colonial, its colonial control. And so we have what Britain calls troubles happening, um, and particularly in places like Palestine, India, Nigeria, and what was then Rhodesia. So there's these debates going on in the House of Commons and in the private letters, which are incredibly meticulously archived in the colonial offices of the British Library, which is a fantastic place to find out what really happened in our history. Um, and so these elite white British men, many of them who all went to like Oxbridge together and just like appoint each other to be colonial administrators of like random countries. And then like if someone misbehaves, they get like demoted to like a smaller colonial holding. Um, and they just talk about this openly in these, in these correspondence letters. Um, so they were considering how best to crush this resistance without looking too violent because people at home were starting to notice that there was all this oppression going on abroad and you're starting to get some resistance at home as well. And so they need a way of maintaining this control that isn't going to look so bad. So at first they reject tear gas because in Europe, the, the actual effects of poison gas during the First World War left many people thinking, well, how would you ever use this on civilians? This was totally barbaric. But of course, in a very Orientalist, Orientalist kind of colonial mindset, uh, this argument was, was then uh, contested. So in a briefing note prepared by the Army Council for Lord Passfield, the council prompted the British government to accept tear gas, and they wrote again from the archives, since our opponents in Oriental countries do not hesitate to torture and murder any of our men whom they may capture, it seems positively ridiculous to boggle at treating them to, say, some sneezing and lacrimatory gas. So in addition to such justifications that those in the Orient were perfect, were deserved basically to be tear gassed in these kinds of colonial arguments, we had these two other problems facing Britain. The first was the problem of passive resistance that was coming out through the Gandhian-led uh, Indian independence movement, and the second was what they referred to as the woman problem. This was particularly happening in Nigeria with the women's war. So women were at the front line of protest, and particularly women protesting against the conditions that had been created through occupation and imperial rule of conflicts that were happening within their kind of familiar and gendered structures and in a home because of changes that the occupying forces had made. And so we couldn't just shoot women. This was the line from uh, the colonial administrators. We had to find other you know, gentler looking ways. We couldn't be barbaric in the way that they were. We had to find these gentler ways of dealing with them. And so tear gas came onto the scene as a way to manage the image of imperialism and colonial power. And that brings us back to settler slavery, slavery driven colonialism of the United States. And so I'm going to jump forward in time here a little bit to give us another glimpse from the archives. So the civil rights movement drew heavily from India's independence movement. 
uh, as well as from labor organizing of the 1930s, which is, of course, less well documented because we don't like to talk about the intersection of race and class in America, side note. So they needed a, a way of controlling the rise of the civil rights movement. Uh, and to make matters more difficult for authorities, they also needed to publicly manage their relationship with the KKK and with the white supremacists and, and separationists who didn't want integration at this time. And of course, as is coming out again now and has been documented throughout history, lots of early law enforcement were, of course, also members of white supremacist organizations. So on September 30th, 1962, lashing out against the enrollment of black student James Meredith, a former Air Force pilot, hundreds of angry white people armed with bottles, rocks, chain, and chains took over the campus. Governor Wallace had dispatched Lingo, who was the safety officer for the, for the state, uh, to go and observe the event. That night, Lingo watched as state troopers and local police withdrew early, reportedly leading to the influx of white rioters. Some state patrolmen later resumed their posts on campus, but were ill-prepared for this escalation of force. A tear gas canister fired by a marshal seriously injured one officer. Others found themselves unable to cope with the amount of tear gas that hung in the air all around and withdrew, claiming their gas masks were ineffective. The military was not impressed by how Mississippi law enforcement handled the situation. Thousands of National Guard and military police were brought in to shut down the riots. By the end of 15 hours of fighting inside thick clouds of tear gas, two civilians were dead and more than 245 people were injured. According to George Wallace's biographer, Stephen Lesher, Wallace and Lingo resolved that what had happened in Mississippi would not happen in Alabama. Instead, they would take a vigilante ethos into their own hands. Cracking down hard on civil rights demonstrators could spare them from having to face angry white mobs. As anti-integrationists with close links to the Klan, Alabama troopers would carry out offensive acts of vigilantism under the cloak of law and order. And I think the important point here is not what we already know, that lots of Southern police officers were white supremacists, but that this is not just an ingrained racism, but an explicit and tactical policing strategy, that by breaking the spirit of civil rights protesters, allowed the police to not have to confront white supremacists. Uh, and so that's our 1960s. Um, and that is the decision in, in, that historians have said. So this is 1962. That led to what happened on the Selma Bridge and what happened to the kind of, was kind of the start of that, that sort of policing of the civil rights movement. So of course, all of these colonial interests are also economic interests. And independence movements threatened profit holdings of the British elite in the 1920s and 1930s, just as the civil rights movement, particularly in its later days, uh, was also about economic emancipation. And again, this is a less well-talked about and less well-historicized aspect of the civil rights movement. At the same time, the push for tear gas was part of a profitable boom for weapons manufacturers in both the 1920s and 30s in the 1960s, and again in the last sort of 10 years, or, or certainly, yeah, since, since the financial collapse, um, which is about 10 years, 10 year anniversary coming up. So, uh, in fact, there is so much of a kind of push to create this market that salespeople would travel around the world looking for unrest and conflict that could be leveraged into new markets for pushing their products. And the same thing happens today in hotel rooms, and in arms fairs all around the world. And so to end, I just want to give us a little bit of the contemporary context of what the market for tear gas looks like and why. Investment researchers at Markets Markets explained in 2013 the prevailing uncertain economic circumstances, the complex political situation, and the deteriorating security condition across the globe have given rise to popular unrest and protests. Unlike other parts of the economy that are hit hard by social unrest, the riot control industrial complex profits off political upheaval. The Arab Spring uprisings in 2011, followed by mass demonstrations across Europe, the United States, Canada, Chile, and later Turkey, U Ukraine, Brazil, and Hong Kong, have generated purchase orders for millions of tear gas canisters and related riot control products, as well as riot control expertise, which travels internationally, um, as Ali might tell us. So meanwhile, supplies to East Africa, Thailand, Indonesia, and the Indian subcontinent also grow as struggles for democracy, the effects of climate change, and economic austerity fuel conflict in these regions. In the West, Britain's withdrawal from the European Union, Trump's election as US president, the refugee crisis in Europe, and the rise of the far right provide excellent marketing opportunities. Experts in the riot control industry carefully track outbreaks of resistance to inform both sellers and buyers of where there are profits to pursue. Sales forces travel the world. 
Tear gas, internationally accepted as the most humane technology for social control, is a top seller. Carrying a stamp of approval from Western democracies, it travels into other nations with colonial era, era promises of civilizing their police forces. And so it is this act of civilizing through tear gas that I think we need to remember to historicize and to use as the basis for our movements that go against the protection of elites from the social threat of those claiming basic rights and democracy. Hello. We're going to go around to uh, Mark Bray now. Uh, Mark Bray is a historian of human rights, terrorism, and political radicalism in, mo in modern Europe, who is one of the organizers of Occupy Wall Street. He is the author of Antifa, the anti-fascist anti uh, handbook, out now from Melville, uh, Translating Anarchy, the Anarchism of Occupy Wall Street, and the co-editor of Anarchist Education and the Modern School, uh, Fra uh, Francisco Ferrer, did I get that right? Reader. Uh, his work has appeared in the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, and other, it's another very, very long, very, very impressive uh, list of publications, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Mark, uh, please take it away. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, and thank you for having me as part of this wonderful panel, Anna, and thank you for writing this fantastic book. Tear Gas is a great book, you should check it out. Um, not only because it's great, because it's super useful for thinking through resistance. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the ways that I see my work relating to this book. And talk about it, and I'm gonna start out not actually about the book that I have over there on Antifa, but about my, my day job, my academic work, and then I'll work into that. So you'll see why. So, I think that a lot of what ties the way that I think about resistance and history and politics to this topic has to do with the question of public perception. And in this case, how did it come to be that people thought that certain forms of policing should be humane? Because there's certainly a change over time, right? If you look at um, early labor demonstrations in the 19th century that were just gunned down mercilessly, right? You have a shift from that to a point where certainly public perception developed to the point where there should be rights, there should be a certain humanity to policing, right? There's a shift that happens. It happens in different ways in different times and places. In some places, arguably, it didn't happen so much, others more so. Of course, it's always a question of what does that mean in practice? So. By the time we pick up the story, in, in, right after World War I, which is where the story picks up, there is a certain receptivity to the fact that the way that the suppression of labor unrest, or even in some cases colonial unrest, should be civilized, as they called it. That, of course, is, is, a, is a product of a history that grew out of the 19th century that has all sorts of steps. Historians have tied it to the generation of what's called a culture of empathy, Lynn Hunt's work on human rights and the development of kind of sympathy with the other is part of it. Um, ab abolitionism, labor struggle, all sorts of forms of resistance develop this kind of moving public standard of what it means to be empathetic, humane, and quote unquote civilized that of course ultimately serves to justify colonialism and imperialism by dressing it up in these kinds of veneers. And that's sort of where the story goes with, with this. But I think it's interesting to think of how fascism responds to that. When fascism and Nazism develop in the 20s and 30s, in part, these ideas develop as a response against this argument that there should be a humane way of dealing with the other. Now, to a large extent, I think we can see that Ami Cesare was right in talking about fascism and Nazism as a kind of European imperialism or colonialism brought home to the European continent. And in that sense, it's part of the same trajectory. But in a European context, fascists and Nazis argue against pursuing a humane route. They argue for essentially extermination, right? And so I think it's interesting to see how, on the one hand, we're talking about this kind of master narrative that at least in some contexts there's this question of humanity. And so when it comes to tear gas, um, the, the question is, of course, part of the work here is to show that it's not nearly as humane as it purports to be. But of course, the point isn't that even if it functioned as it were 
was supposed to be that even if it functioned as the way that its manufacturer's design, that it would be the end of the story, right? <laughs> the goal is not just like, oh, let's make a tear gas that doesn't kill people, right? This, that's the first step in a conversation. But when we talk about resistance, and here I'm gonna kind of segue into the, the Antifa book, we can think about it, I think, to some extent in terms of how do our methods and tactics and the methods and tactics of those we are resisting, how are they constrained or not by these kinds of questions of what it means to be humane or just or reasonable? So part of the argument that anti-fascists make about resisting fascism and Nazism historically and today is that when these kinds of people get into power, they will not be so responsive to these kinds of norms. Part of their political project is destroying these norms. And you can see even like in a more everyday sense the kind of popularity of the right-wing memes about running over protesters with cars and the kind of you know um, uh, anti-PC, quote unquote, rejection of the notion that protesters should be treated with any kind of consideration, uh, evident in Donald Trump's comments to the police that they should be actively roughing up protesters. So there's, there's a certain tendency within far-right politics that pushes back against the notion of even having these norms. So it seems to some extent, part of the goal of social movements is to defend and expand these norms to say, wait, when you, when you are shooting these, this tear gas, it's having real consequences on people. It can be deadly, it can be life destroying. And to go beyond that, and, and, and create new norms because obviously the point, as I said, isn't to make tear gas safe so much as it is to recognize that it is a veneer for a system of violence designed to uphold uh, economic injustices, social injustices, and so forth. But also that, um, yeah, one minute, I'll wrap up. But also I think that, um, so in that sense, it's a question of these kind of master values, but also in, in terms of thinking about what to do when we're struggling against people who want to destroy them altogether. And in that way, I think that it's, our forms of resistance need to take those kinds of dynamics into account. Um, and ultimately, it's a kind of push and pull over what, what is humane and what isn't. Um, very briefly, my book's about the history of militant anti-fascism in the US and Europe over the past century based on interviews, history, popular politics. Check it out if you want to. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. <laughs>
which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants which most likely, some of them in all likelihood, continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do, like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. Um, so I just chose that because it kind of honors um, Eric Garner's life and I think talks about some of the aims of the Black Lives Matter movement and the movement about policing. But to go back before Eric Garner was murdered in July 2014, there was the moment of the 2011 uprisings. And people at WRL um, saw this as a convergence of um, popular protest, uh, global repression, and then also things to champion. So we um, actually, in direct collaboration with Anna at times, which is, there's the beautiful relationship between researchers and scholars and, and movement building these past few years, um, tried to tell some of the stories um, of people that got tear gas, but not just their stories of repression, but also of what their demands were. <clears throat> Here's a friend, Samah Salim, who's in New York, but had been tear gassed in Tahrir Square. People are familiar with the famous Cairo Square, um, and she describes you know, wanting to bring down, in, in that moment um, in 2012, the military government, um, which was, was holding back and kind of leading the counter-revolution at the time. So these stories really helped um, spurn us to have like very specific demands. Um, we could talk about this comic a little more later, which tries to talk about some of the forces behind um, these tear gassings and, and the fact that Safariland specifically was a company distributing tear gas all over the world, featuring um, its kind of mega mogul founder Warren B. Kanders there smirking ominously, and then also talking about the kind of secondary connections so that um, collaborating with Safariland was a bike company, a very well-loved Northwest kind of, you know, um, liberal bastion of biking in Portland and Seattle that didn't want maybe to be associated with repression and, um, and, and uh, suppressing of movements, and that we kind of began to pressure um, a little bit in, in trying to find a target, you know, for, for these, these campaigns to end um, the use of tear gas. That then expanded to uh, a brief history to find, finding some of those co um, conventions and, and weapons expos that police go to, which was, it began with Urban Shield. Um, people might be familiar. This is in Oakland. It had been going on for several years. And campaigning from a cross-movement coalition and focusing on police militarization as a local example of global militarism um, over the years was successful in kicking out of Oakland. Um, and building a kind of a very interesting coalition um, that we were helped, uh, helped found. Um, and I wanted to read actually just a paragraph from Anna's book that I found very related to that point where she says, tear gas is a weapon that polices the atmosphere and pollutes the very air we breathe. It turns the square, the march, the public assembly into a toxic space, taking away what is off so often the last communication channel people have left to use. If the right to gather, to speak out, is to mean anything, then we must also have the right to do so in air that we can breathe. So <clears throat> I think that symbolic aspect of tear gas, the question of police going to weapons conventions that seem much like um, the ones that uh, military goes to, um, and the fact that there's 100 SWAT raids a day, which use were on terror to justify um, mostly raiding uh, the homes of, of of black and Latinx people um, make it a very strong target and a way to unite various issues at once. And the fact that Urban Shield isn't the only one, um, the evolution of our work into what we call no SWAT zone um, and, and, and facing fear culture, fear culture domestically expanded to Chicago where there was a similar um, weapons expo and most recently um, one in Florida where a group called the Dream Defenders you might be familiar with um, is beginning to collaborate with us. In fact, next week is their version of, of Urban Shield there that features SWAT teams from Brazil, Jamaica, Sweden, and Russia, uh, it seems. So, um, so just thinking about how these targets might, um, might interact with the evolving uh, non-lethal um, profit industry, and then also how it can maybe help us reframe the question of resistance to what we can actively support since um, these are not just victims, but people rising up um, in, in an organized fashion and in a, in a kind of a defense of their, their humanity, which um, I think we need to win. So excited to talk further. Thanks, everybody.
so much, Ali. Um, so our final panelist is uh, Ellie Kaufman. Uh, uh, who has spent more than 30 years immersed in radical movements as a participant, a strategist, a journalist, and an observer. She has been called a virtuoso organizer by journalist Scott Sherman for her role in saving community gar gardens and public libraries in New York City, thank you very much, um, from development. Uh, Kaufman coordinated the grassroots mo mobilizing efforts for the huge protest against the Iraq War in 2003-2004. Uh, her writings on American radicalism and social movement history have been published in The Nation, M Plus One, The Baffler, and many other places. So please, LA. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Anna, so much for this book. Congratulations on it. It's um, quite a, an achievement of, of research and synthesis, and it's really a very useful tool um, for organizers in a lot of context. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about, uh, well, well, I'm just actually curious, how many people here have actually been tear gassed ever? A few. Um, I have to say that when I started reading your book, it was, as, as the kids say these days, it was a little triggering because it brought back um, the experience of being um, tear gassed, which has happened to me several times, including the, the last time that it happened, um, I was uh, in the second trimester of a high-risk twin pregnancy. Um, it was at Miami during the, the, I was one of the organizers of the FTA protests in Miami in 2000 and, Three, which is one of the um, more ominous examples of policing, um, of out of control policing uh, in, in the US. Um, and it was not a place really to be if you were in the second trimester of a high risk pregnancy. Um, I'm happy to say my, my, my twins were, were born healthy. I told one of them this story the other night and she was like, mom, you should have been more careful. <laughs> like, I was very careful, but uh, you know, uh, the police were a little less so. Um, but uh, you know, so it, um, my, my work, um, uh, both as an organizer and um, as a movement historian, is focused on the U.S. context, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, you know, the, the first uh, times that I encountered the use of these chemical weapons in the U.S. Um, was in the, the mid-late 90s in the forest defense movement. Um, on the West Coast against um, Earth Firsters. And there was a particularly horrible um, incident where um, some uh, people were blockading, doing a stationary lockdown blockade, using the kind of lock boxes that were in um, that, that image that, that Ali had from the Urban Shield where people put their arms in these tubes. Um, and the whole idea is that you clipped yourself inside it and you can unclip yourself. So um, as a pain compliance measure in order to break the blockade, they applied um, pepper spray directly into people's eyes with um, Q-tips. Um, you can hear the screams on camera, it was filmed, um, which was the first time, I, you know, sort of since the legends of like the tear gas over Berkeley, which you evoke so powerfully in your book, you know, it, it really had not been in, uh, around in organizing spaces that I had seen in a, a lot of the 80s and 90s. Um, and there was a way in which um, it was like the crunchy bike cops of the West Coast who seemed to be the pioneers of using it mm. against um, stationary direct action blockades. Um, again, um, in Seattle in, in 1999, which was the first time I was like full on, you know, in the clouds of tear gas. Um, uh, that too, um, the way that they used it was actually um, whatever you might think from whatever images you have in your mind about the 1999 Seattle WTO, they did not use it against the Black Bloc. I was there when the Black Bloc started and did began doing the, the things that the Black Bloc was doing that day. Um, and uh, the, the police did not tear gas and the tear gas was used exclusively against the, uh, initially against the stationary lockdown um, blockades where people were using lock boxes to um, hold them, hold intersections, um, and that's when the gassing began. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's um, there's many, many wonderful passages um, in Anna's book. Um, but one of the things that she writes about is how um, the tear gas as a weapon is both psychological, uh, is both physical and psychological. That it um, it forces you um, to disperse, um, but it's also it demoralizes you. Um, and uh, I guess I wanted to add uh, that there's a third dimension of it as well, um, which is that it's aesthetic, is that it, mm. it um, changes the perception of what's happening. Um, Anna does write about that quite powerfully, where she talks um, in writing about uh, the civil rights movement, 
um, in that context. She talks about how tear gas turns civilians into criminals. Um, and there's a way in which the, the presence of tear gas turns a protest into a riot, no matter what anybody has been doing before or after. Um, and also a way in which it turns protesters into a black bloc, whether that's what they were doing or not, because it forces people to mask up. Um, and um, there's lots of consequences for organizing um, in having these meanings, these tactics, and these aesthetics sort of imposed on you by your enemy. And, and many times, you know, um, very few people would, um, would know, for instance, that it, it, the Seattle WTO protests, that the, the specific reason that they started using tear gas was to dislodge these stationary blockade. They, they think it was a response to the people who were smashing windows because if you do an edit in a news clip and you show people smashing windows and then you show the clouds of tear gas, it seems like, you know, action, reaction. When, when in fact they were in different parts of the city um, and, uh, you know, had, had no direct correlation to each other. Um, now, I'm one who, um, um, has uh, had a lot of longstanding concerns, um, uh, 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 some tactical but overwhelmingly aesthetic with the black bloc and with the, with the, with the black bloc tactic and the kind of um, way in which um, it uh, mimics the, the, the militarism of those it's opposing, the way in which there's um, a hyper-masculinity and a kind of a militarized Aesthetic. So I was I was part of a project. I sent um, Anna the link. It still exists on the Wayback Machine, which was really fun to find. Um, I was part of a, a project in um, after the the second major time I was tear gas, which I brought one of the canisters from, um, which was uh, the FTAA protest in uh, Quebec City in April 2001, where they um, they kind of had the heights and they barraged us with 5,000 canisters of tear gas. It was a really just astonishing. Um, amount of poison that was rained down upon us. Um, and there, there were folks, um, mostly black bloc um, folks, who were you know, throwing the canisters back, which seemed like a, 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 a righteous and good thing to be doing. Um, but there was you know, kind of this aesthetic, uh, this aesthetic that went along with, with that form of self-defense. So uh, I was up there with a, with a radical fairy friend, and we started um, imagining, well, what, what would it look like if the people throwing the tear gas canisters back, you, you know, yes, we're protected by gas masks, but we're wearing, like, pink ball gowns and, like, sparkly um, glitter gas masks instead. Um, so it, looking toward the next big anti-globalization protest in the U.S., we started this project called the Masquerade Project, and we raised a lot of money. We bought tons of, of uh, gas masks. We brought hundreds and hundreds of gas masks. Um, and we started um, organizing them. We bought all this glitter and, and rhinestones. And we started organizing these gas mask decorating parties in order to essentially culture jam so that we could be protecting people from these very, very dangerous, very damaging um, chemical weapons. Anna um, it goes into this quite powerfully, how, how uh, really um, very damaging the, these weapons are. Um, so people could protect themselves, but could, um, you know, fuck with the aesthetics of it all um, and, and, and embrace a different uh, uh, form of collective self-defense. Um, and we got a huge response. Um, we had done all these prototypes. We had done photos. We had done a you know big photo shoot. We had built a website. And we were, had, were all set to have our first gas mask runway fashion show and gas mask decorating party on September 12th, oh, 2001. Uh, so we obviously, uh, not only did we cancel that event, but um, we ended up having a gas mask undecorating night because there was a call, an urgent call out for um, protective gear for the, the, the first responders at Ground Zero. So we actually sat and we peeled all the rhinestones off the gas masks and, and took them down to Ground Zero um, and donated them to the, 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 the emergency personnel. Um, the protests we were, we were building towards the, uh, the uh, World Bank IMF protests that fall were canceled as it happened. 
Um, uh, and it was some time, uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, again, not until 2003 in Miami that there was really a, a major um, use of, of tear gas in the US. But I think um, it, it's important when we think about um, the effect of these to, to, to think in um, over the long term. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a good reason why um, the, this is part of the psychological warfare against movements. And I, I think people who were in Ferguson and who had the experience of being tear gassed night after night, again, partly as an aesthetic intervention to cast them as rioters, um, you know, as well as a policing intervention. Um, uh, the levels of, of lasting trauma are, are really staggering and really damaging. Um, and you can, you can see how um, the trauma um, really uh, uh, undermines um, movement building. So um, the, the work that, that Anna is doing to help uh, you know, organize against the, these tear gas profiteers is so important. Um, and, but I also want to end uh, with a call for us to, you know, this, this like orphan project that never quite happened. Um, I, I'd like to call for us to think imaginatively about how we defend ourselves in ways that build the kinds of movements and the kind of communities we want to have, um, both in how we treat each other, but in also how we look and how we present ourselves to the world. Um, there's a way in which tear gas is one of many ways um, in which we get um, uh, backed into competing on a terrain not of our choosing. Um, and if we want to um, open up our sense, our radical sense of possibility, I think we need to think about challenging that. Thank you so much. Um, wow, this is great. So we're gonna do a couple questions uh, with each other. Um, the, the sort of hat I wear at Brooklyn Institute is uh, social and political theory. That's what I teach, that's what I write on. And so I prepared like a really interesting uh, political economy question that I will still ask Anna because I'm really curious about it. Um, but actually having listened to all of, all of you guys speak, I have a couple other things that I think might uh, be germane. Uh, and I'm curious to hear what everyone uh, has to say. Um, and the, fir the first one that comes to mind is, you know, there was everything from the discussion of sort of World War I, the colonial situation, um, uh, questions of movement building, questions of, of fascist mass politics, right? Is uh, how much should we understand, but so here's the question, how much should we understand tear gas as a sort of uh, technology of, of and against mass politics? Um, and and the, the second part of this question is, is, is kind of a question about efficiency almost. Like, um, how good is it at what it's supposed to do? Uh, not just in the sort of anti-lethality stuff, which I think Anna does a wonderful job of sort of poking holes in that story, um, but in, in, uh, in sort of affecting a kind of democratic suppression, perhaps, um, that just spraying bullets, as you talk about in the Amritsar uh, riots in India, um, perhaps uh, you know, had the opposite effect. So go to town. I don't know who wants to go first. Maybe just because it's your book. Yeah. We're just over here. Um, yes, I would agree that tear gas <laughs> is a technology of and against mass politics. Um, I think uh, Il Weissman's thing in his little roundabout book is, is really nice, where he talks about it as the opposite of the, of the roundabout. So if, there, if we saw lots of uses of squares and circles and roundabouts as what brought people together, in, in particularly in the wave of protests in 2011, then tear gas is the thing that breaks the roundabout. Um, or the square apart. Uh, and I think that's a really nice sort of thinking about the visual architecture and the actual ways in which we call it when we're being, and with our academic hats on, um, a uh, atmospheric governance in the work I do with Anya Kangisa, um, so that the goal is actually to be policing the atmosphere itself um, rather than thinking about it as policing the ground alone. Obviously, all the barricades and the actual lines of cops are policing the ground as well. Um, how good is it? I mean, I think. Uh, LA's point about the lasting trauma is absolutely crucial because these are their memories, their sense memories. So it's not just people who have the physical effects, or you know, I document a lot of the people who have been killed and injured by tear gas in the book, but it's also all the people who weren't or who watched their friends. Uh, be killed and injured and, and just the, the panic or the, the knowing that if you go to a place where you don't think there's going to be that level of violence there is, is, is a major deterrent and they know that. Um, the other really important political econ economic point about tear gas is that it's very cheap. It's much, much cheaper than other forms of, of policing, um, which is true in, in general of lots of kinds of aerial warfare, um, but I won't get into that. Um, 
Yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave it there and see what else people want to say. just want to add one quick thing about the question of um, is it a technology versus mass politics? Well, yes, but I think in another sense, which is what I think you were touching upon, it's, it's a technology to create a good mass politics and a bad mass politics because, <laughs> because the implication is that if a demonstration or a movement is being tear gassed, that's a bad mass politics right. or arguably not mass politics, it's arguably a, a riot or whatever kind of derogatory term. And in that way, in, in societies that pride themselves on being participatory, it creates that dichotomy. So I would bring that into it. Yeah, and I also think, um, again, this is in the US context, does not um, perhaps apply as much um, outside the United States, but a lot of the uses have been, um, this was not true in, in Ferguson, but a lot of the uses have been kind of more surgical, right? I mean, so, um, I mean, the, the, the you know, the, the Q-tips in the yeah. eye being an example, there's, there's a way in which, for instance, um, you know, they don't tear gas in New York City because, um, because of the atmospheric effects. It's, it's used um, more surgically, um, it's, more, it's more the pepper spray, um, or, or when tear gas is, is used, it's used in a much more confined and limited way. So, um, it, you know, it still has that, that same effect of, of casting the protesters, whoever they are, as bad protesters. But I, I, haven't, um, uh, I haven't seen it used at mass, at truly mass mobilizations in the U.S. It's actually been used much more at militant mobilizations, whether they're militantly nonviolent or militantly something else, but it's, it's to dislodge um, you know, a kind of, of, of resistance that's marked by kind of its strength and tenacity um, more than by its numbers. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, um, yeah, the, the question about the different contexts is, is very relevant because um, <clears throat> thinking about going back to 2011, kind of this moment of tear gas, but then also Bahrain, for example, um, just a few weeks ago, like the protests against the regime there continue, um, and that being maybe kind of the, the capital of tear gas globally. Recently, um, I think it's, it's in those cases, actually, I think what you described as um, an ineffective technology, because in Egypt, in Mohammed Mahmoud, it actually has, has grown the protests every time they use it so indiscriminately, um, because they're saying that all mass politics are not allowed, really, um, and they, they, they must disperse. So then how that relates to here in the U.S. is, is a complicated question, too, because um, in many ways, uh, and then like the memory of Eric Garner and, and policing as a whole, SWAT raids are not spectacular. Um, they don't use, uh, you know, like these, these moments of mass gatherings but rather are like very mundane they're trying to serve a warrant for someone's like credit card fraud and this happens hundreds of times per week so um so how do you then use the like attention that tear gas gets um or the kind of inspiration and militancy of ferguson to then talk about how militarism as a technology has has shown the kind of violent edge of policing but that um uh, i have a great thing here from chicago our friends there who was evolved to talk about how much money goes into policing every day compared to kind of other things, and it's, f it's, it's $4 million a day. So that, how much of that is to suppress protest? You know, there's some, but most of it is actually just to, act, you know, take away from the, the city budget, which desperately needs uh, support and, uh, and other life-affirming um, resources. That's crazy. Um, so. I mean, that's a really good segue into sort of into, I mean, uh, you, uh, Anna, you mentioned the, the, the cheapness and you're, you're talking about sort of budgets and there's a wonderful chapter uh, towards the, the end of the book where you give us this uh, scene of the sort of like tear gas expo, right? Um, but one of the things you mentioned in there uh, is that, uh, and, and, it, and it resonates with a lot of, of the sort of more economic side of the story that we've been talking about here, uh, is that right? It's it is an, it's inexpensive. Um, there's not quite as much profit as in like big as in big weapons. So I'm curious about the interaction, uh, like uh, like how the markets are grown. I mean, you talk about this a little bit in the book, but I'm sure I'm curious about how the markets are grown, and also what is the relationship between the sort of quote unquote non-lethal weapon. Uh, manufacturers and uh, uh, international weapons manufacturing, which is, which you know, is, is as you mentioned in the book, sort of, it does is a tra is a transnational phenomenon, right? It's not just American companies or Israeli companies. It's like American and Israeli companies and German and South African countries. Yeah, 
Um, so most of the major manufacturers, companies manufacturing tear gas, manufacture lots of other weapons, um, usually less lethal weapons, but then often they're also subdivisions of larger arms companies. So like Grand Mattel Denel, which is German and South African, also does, uh, one of their other divisions does, you know, missiles and stuff. Kanders, who we saw through the Savari Land, that comic that Ali put up, um, he has, it's like a group, and then under that group is like 30 different brands of policing and security weapons, and they've just bought Sierra Bullets, uh, which is one of the biggest ammunition companies in the U.S. And so the, they're, the, this is, it goes across the spectrum. And actually, one of my undergrad students, uh, in a, who, when I was teaching in advertising, said this wonderful thing to me one day, which was like, what they're trying to do is like any other branded product, they want you to have something for every occasion. And so... That this is what they're selling to the police is, is, is a way to respond and at every level. And then soon after he said that Condor, the big Brazilian company, actually came out with this ad which shows you like the life cycle of the escalation of force and which products of theirs to use at each level of the escalation of force uh, pyramid. And this is becoming the way that you, the, the kind of dominant way in which you market. Um, market these weapons, and then of course they also sell the training, and you know, Taser is kind of the leader in this, so Taser sells all of the weapons, all of the training for the weapons, the body cameras that then record the police use of the weapons, which are smart cameras, which are all now hooked up through their network computer system with the Tasers themselves and their other kinds of electronic weapons that are able to record uses, making the weapons and the data s smarter, and now they also sell you the databases and the database maintenance that you need in order to what they call um, what it's uh, evolve evolve your police department into the digital era of cloud computing where all of your weapons your body cameras and everything speak to each other on these then algorithmic databases that are also like doing this kind of demographic crime prediction and all of these things are going to get super smart and talk to each other and Taser's going to own all of it. And Taser also has loads of lawyers and loads of scientists that go on to the committees that make all these things continue to be legal, right? So they have this entire sort of system that, that is in its entirety and its larger effect becomes a kind of money-making and propaganda, you know, sort of machine. I don't know if anyone else wants to lay it out. This is a very specific kind of question. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was burning in my mind. Um, I'll just ask one more, and then I think we'll we'll get some questions from the audience. Or actually, I'll, if you guys have questions for each other too, uh, I'll, I'll ask that. But um, one thing that struck me, you know, from the sort of poem uh, to uh, Ellie, you very specifically used instead of you didn't say tear gas at first, you said chemical weapons, mm -hmm. uh, and this reminded me of a, of, a, of a of a passage in Anna's book where you talk about the British saying, "Well, we'll call them tear." Mm -hmm. Was it like smoke? We won't call them tear gas. That sounds like the mustard gas in the trenches. That was quite terrible. Like, let's call it tear smoke. And I'm wondering about this sort of use of language. I mean, you get into a little bit of branding, but like use of language both in sort of selling, but also in how we might create a different discourse around tear gas. And I am thinking of you two <laughs> in particular here. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to name them as chemical weapons and to say that as often as possible because it's, I mean, it simply is what they are, and anything else is a euphemism. Um, and uh, you know, the 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 um, the, uh, the the portrayal of them as you know less lethal, um, even even if that's uh, literally true in terms of number of fatalities, um, ends up minimizing the harm, which is um, both you know immediate and lasting. And, I think another uh, strong point that we used often, <clears throat> um, because uh, those uh, stories of tear gassings and the Facing Tear Gas project um, led to people wanting to collaborate uh, across around the world. So uh, Palestinians and, and Chileans and, and um, people in Greece. So a demand that we started to talk about was to recategorize tear gas in the Chemical Weapons Convention um, as a weapon of war uh, because it had been banned during wartime, because I think, as I understand, y'all can correct me, but it would amplify, like, if you're trying to shoot people with a machine gun and then tear gas them, it's ways to actually kill all of them. So that was seen as too inhumane. Um, but then there was an exception that partly, the, I think the US government at the time repeatedly um, put into the law, which said it can be used in riot control circumstances. Um, so 
so, so I know that there have been you know, waves of, of attempts to say, no, this has felt like war to people, um, the way that it's affecting bystanders, protesters, the culture of, of violence, kind of like not allowing um, new norms to be like kind of more humane, right, regressing in that sense. But it hasn't happened. Um, maybe we need deeper, broader networks and collaborations with fancy lawyers. I don't know. <laughs> You know, just one more actually that, that, that sort of jumped into my mind listening to, the, to, to you respond to that question, um, which is this question of uh, maybe this is too dark. I don't know if I should go with it, but like, you know, we've been thinking about it. It's a very dark topic. Very dark topic. No, no, <laughs> but, there, uh, you know, Mark, uh, in your presentation, you, you mentioned, you know, this, this is a known fact, right? Early labor, uh, like strikes and things of the same, would be broken up by like Pinkertons, right? You just, and they'd just come in and shoot everyone, beat everyone up at best, but most, just shoot people. Um, like, is there a way in which we should understand tear gas in this kind of like grossly economic way where it's like, I can gas the people and, and they're still <laughs> functional or like they're functional different ways? Is, is it a disciplining thing? Is, is it, more than it's a political thing? Like, what, what is going, is there something happening there, or? Well, I mean, I mean, part of it is all of the above, yeah. right? Um, so, so, I mean, there's different ways to focus on it. There's the economic imperative. Um, I'm most personally interested in the ways that, right, so if, if we take a step back and look at the violence of policing, we can see that policing it is violence, and it is a defense for a violent system and the prison system is violence, right? So if we're talking about violence, right, the violence of tear gas or of any of these specific methods is sort of like a tip of the iceberg. So to me, it seems like the, when there is resistance, there's a need for these institutions to legitimate themselves. And it's always a back and forth. And there's gonna be adjustments by the state, by capital, as there's resistance. And it seems like to me, tear gas not necessarily in its original design, but in the way, the role that it has come to play is a way of saying that we will suppress you in a humane way. And there's other ways that, you know, all sorts of ranges of doing this. Uh, so clearly, it seems to me there's two conversations. One is how do movements push back and say, no, these are not humane. But it seems to me there's also the transformative question of if we're talking about inhumanity, the sort of these veneers are only part of the conversation. It's also what's beneath them. That might be a really, really good, I mean, talking about sort of movement uh, reactions might be a really good time to transition. I know Anna wants to do a little demonstration. Yeah, do you guys want to learn how to identify a riot control weapon since we're here? Yeah, a little interactivity. And then and you, we can think of our questions while we're doing this. Okay, so I'm going to ask someone for, does someone want to? Do you want me to ask? Uh, so who, who wants uh, someone like be an intrepid soul and like volunteer to help Anna with her de demonstration, please? You're not going to get your ass. You're just going like, yeah, to use your phone. You're going to yeah. take a photo and you're going to look something up on the internet. Thanks. Okay. Come on up, sir. Volunteer. Okay, so, so, what, so the guide first, this is a little floppy guide. Um, it's a little bit difficult to figure out how to fold. It should fold in such a way that this ends up being covered. And the idea is that you can stick it in your wallet or your pocket, you can have it on you uh, when you are in a situation in which it might come in hand. So you start it, we have a video that actually demonstrates this on the website, it's so complicated. And then you fold it backwards, and then you fold it in half. Oh, I can't, I couldn't do this to save my life. And then you fold it in half, like the long way, and then you fold it in half again. The one that says right. And then you have your right idea, you got it. You got it. You got it. 
Okay. So um, the main thing that we tried to do with this project is that um, one of the things that happens is that when these weapons are being used, a lot of people don't know what they are, um, which means that people don't know how to medically respond to them, and they don't know how to understand their effects, and they also then don't know how to record and monitor what's happening. And for anything to actually count legally as recording and monitoring, there's like such a meticulously detailed amount of things that you need to be recording, which is like completely unrealistic to do in the middle of a uh, protest that has been turned into a riot uh, through the use of these weapons. Um, and so the idea of this project, as, as we were watching lots of citizen journalism, people on the streets um, in Teher at first and then in Ferguson, try and figure out how to keep a record of the kinds of weapons that are being used and trying to figure out what companies they're coming from. And so we wanted to create a system to help people um, understand how to monitor and identify these weapons, and that's where this guide was born. Um, and so, yes, I'll show you quickly how it works if you want to come up with your phone. Come on. Um, so LA, LA has generously donated this, which if we look at, we probably wouldn't know necessarily what it was. Um, it would also be really hot, so we would not want to be holding it in our hands right away, uh, which is one of the first pieces of advice here, don't touch it while it's really hot. You'll see in lots of images from Occupy Gezi and other places that people wear really big kind of construction gloves whenever they're hands handling things and, and masks as well. Um, and so the idea is when, if, if you find yourself in possession or near, it doesn't have to be at your home, um, a cancer of some kind, that what you want to do is, after you've stayed safe, following the safety instructions, is that you want to document all angles of the uh, advice, looking especially anything where there is any kind of writing on it. So you would take a picture at one angle, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Maybe you have a all the way on, you would turn it, or you move around it, and so forth, right? Uh, and then, if you turn over to the back of your guide, we start to have descriptions of what it might be that you are seeing. So this is a really tricky one, because you'll notice that it's not on here. Um, and that is because this is part of a special weapon, which is actually documented on the other infographic. Um, which split is a tear gas canister, but it splits into three pieces, which is a common thing that's been around for quite a number of decades now. And they do that so that you cover more space. So you have one canister breaks into three parts, and then it's dislodged from three parts. Also makes it harder, decreases the throwback phenomenon, as we heard about mm -hmm. before. So purchasers throwing things back, um, and, and makes it harder for people to get it out of the way. So, and it also makes it harder to identify, which, if you are the company that is selling it, is a good thing for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we do at Riot ID is, if you, uh, if you can't figure it out yourself, um, you send the pictures to us and we do IDs for you, or we are training people how to do the IDs for themselves. So basically, um, you can do this, or anyone who has a smartphone and has internet can do this. You put in all of the details that are available anywhere on the canister. So this one has 515 and C, and you can probably figure out if you have been reading uh, one of our guides that it probably says CS because that is a type of Right, the gas. Yeah. So you would put this in there, and then it also says conveniently on the back, triple chaser grenade. And so that should be enough yeah, information for you to do an ID as to what this is. So if you stick that into your phones and you're doing it, you can see what it tells you. Did what? Anything? Should I send it to you? No, you just Google it. So Google 515CS triple chaser grenades. If I was with my students, you would all have your phone. You'd be so excited right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it will, it should at that point start to return to you what kind of weapon it is, and that should give you the company. We've got it, we've identified it. Yeah, triple chaser. Triple chaser grenade. Separating canister. Separating canister. Separating canister. If I hold this in front Safari of the camera, it'll go on the big picture. Oh, there you go. Wow. Yeah, all right. Safari land. Yeah, great. So we know that it's made by Safari land. <laughs> <laughs> and where did you pick this one up? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, Quebec City in 2001. There you go. Uh, so yeah. we so thank you, Spiraland. 
know that it's from Safari Land, which is that Warren Canvas company. And interestingly, it's a defense tech, which is the company that morphed out of Federal Laboratories, which is one of the first tear gas companies, started by one of Genovese and one of his buddies back after the First World War. Uh, and so we start to be able to kind of create um, and is on a, a global accountability of where these companies come from. And so the last thing that is on the right ID guide are the major manufacturers of um, tear gases. So defense technology is the one that's going to justify around one candors, which is what the chase um, comes from. Uh, and so this is the idea, is that we start to begin, and then we aggregate these, and these are collected and stored, and we begin to get some kind of picture of what this global trade looks like and what kinds, and how we kind of create these chains of, of accountability. And this has been used uh, by some groups to actually identify which company uh, produced what canister that has been involved in a death or a serious injury as well. Um, okay, so that is the Right ID project, and that's the information on it, and it's used to, do, to train humanitarian and street medics and so forth in the world. Um, and it's kind of, yeah, our way of thinking about how do we actually translate a lot of this very complicated research into something that we might actually be able to use in a public health way. Okay. Awesome. Done. Thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> It also like magically synced up with like everyone's presentation. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Um, so yes, if anyone has questions uh, that you want to ask to any of our panelists, to, to Anna, to Mark, to LA, or to Ali, please. Or to uh, in the front, please. And there should be a, a mic, so just wait for the mic to come around to you. Thank you very much. Oh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. I have a sort of two questions or maybe comments um, that relate to some of the things you were talking about, but also I hope you can elaborate on. Um, the first is, I'm just curious as to what the threshold is for its use. Um, we haven't really spoken about at what point do these weapons get used. I mean, the perception is, of course, the aesthetic is that the moment that there's any um, violent protest, but I think, I mean, as a Palestinian, I know that they throw them <laughs> for much uh, lesser things than that. Um, so yeah, at what point do, does it, do they get lobbed? Um, the second question is much more about how can we organize resistance around them as a symbol? Because clearly, um, I know that when Ferguson was happening, there was a, a big Twitter, I mean, I think Ali, you alluded to it in that there were Twitter conversations happening between Palestinians advising African Americans and Ferguson how to, you know, not to rub their eyes and offering advice and that sort of thing. I was wondering if there um, is scope for it to be a, for, uh, a symbol for resistance against it, and if so, um, what might that look like? I mean, I think the question of, whoa, that was really bad feedback. The question of the threshold, I mean, it seems that it's very discretionary based on the, 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 the it, 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 it always creates the image that it's responding to some escalation from the side of the protesters, but it, at least in my, you know, limited firsthand experience, um, it, it seems that the threshold I've seen is um, protesters who are difficult to dislodge for one reason or another, which is very different from responding to violence. I've not seen it. In fact, you know, on the contrary, um, what I've seen in um, policing of you know protests where that that um, turned into um, something that's more legitimately looking like a riot, you usually see the police pull back and you usually see restraint. So there's a, there's a way in which, at least in the U.S., that's what I've seen. Um, so there's a way in, in which um, uh, I think there's, there's so much myth-making um, involved every time it's used that it, it's very difficult to even um, say that there's, there's you know, some, some threshold, certainly, um, uh, uh, you know, the idea that there would be warnings uh, given, uh, which is uh, supposed to be part of the protocol in certain contexts, you know, is, is entirely mythic. Um, you know, the question of, um, you know, how one, uh, that, the, that moment of solidarity in Ferguson was very powerful to witness on, on, on Twitter and, and people um, in, in Ferguson talked a lot um, when I was interviewing people there, people that would come up, the people felt that sense of global solidarity. So, um, so in a sense, you're, you've answered your question in part: is that there's um, there's a way in which the you know the collective knowledge of people who have 
have faced down these weapons um, and, and continued to organizing despite their demoralizing effects, um, it, you know, is a very powerful, powerful form of solidarity. Uh, just a, a legal answer for the for the threshold. I mean, one of the problems, as we were alluding to before, this stuff gets really complicated once we get into like the policy when I, it will put you to sleep. But um, the Chemical Weapons Convention, which is the major international policy, which not all countries are signed on to, um, is has this exception that that came in the 90s that said that riot control, like actually put into the international policy that riot, that riot control age that in a police or law enforcement context, these things are riot control agents and not chemical weapons to get at this other issue. Um, so they are illegal in war, but allowed under this other name. And it's, they have a slightly different chemical con con concentration. Um, but if they're used in mass, it doesn't matter if they have less chemicals because you're just overdosing people. Um, so that, that's, the that's the international policy legal. Uh, countries are supposed to, like in a humanitarian sense, follow the UN basic principles of force, which say that basically almost every use that we ever see in Palestine would be like illegal under this, but there's no legal backing to UN protocols, right? Um, and there's no, no one like making sure that countries follow them, follow them, right? Because that's, we, you know, we'll be here all day if we talk about like how effective or ineffective the UN is. Um, but that's the sort of, people who do this work from a, a policy context who know lots more about it than I do, um, could give you like painstaking detail on all of these things. Um, and that's why like it comes up a lot in these sorts of contexts, right, of whether or not it's used. Um, there's been organized, it, it, after the first intifada, there was actually, there were some embargoes on um, the shipment of tear gas to uh, Palestine. And there's really, really amazingly meticulous data recorded on, on deaths and injuries from it in, in, the, 19, in the 80s. Um, so there, there, there is precedence that we see these little moments where there have been quite organized campaigns, but every, almost every like boycott or stop shipment, uh, just it's like they become these blips and they don't actually turn into a larger movement like we saw against something like landmines, though I know Ali and I have talked about that and that's also complicated as a model. Um, but, but basically, like, there are these moments, but they've just not kind of coalesced in that kind of more transnational way. And the question of what then a symbolic form of solidarity around it might do, especially if paired with a kind of policy or boycott uh, or st shipment stopping sort of model, I think there, there could be something quite, quite powerful in the combination of those things. And I think the kind of um, storytelling uh, facing tear gas project was a great example of creating that kind of international solidarity and a lot of the kinds of um, art objects and creative objects that get circulated a lot of them coming out of Palestine like the garden and the tree um, where, and Amnesty just did these candles um, for Gezi as a commemoration where they sent these candles that smelled of tear gas uh, out to people and so there we see these really beautiful kind of sensory moments that are trying to to work through that trauma through this kind of collective process so i i wonder what the possibilities are for pairing this incredibly difficult sort of international law policy stuff with kind of shipment stopping which is usually done by like dock workers and cargo workers with a kind of more sort of activist based transnational solidarity it's a big it's a small task for anyone in the room The two times that um, I've been tear gassed were in Bogota and Athens, and they were both, there we go, uh, they were both in the context of basically street battles with the police in the context of strikes, but in Athens, um, this is back in 2012, uh, there were, there was graffiti and posters around the city of angels in gas masks and people in all walks of life from all ages wearing ga uh, gas masks. And so there was sort of a protest imagery of all of us are resisting, all of us are wearing gas masks. That's a symbol of resistance. And it seemed to me as a way to sort of push back against the good mass politics, bad mass politics dichotomy by saying that no, when tear gas is flying, it doesn't mean that we're illegitimate, it means that we're the people. Um, so it seems like part of any of these kinds of narratives of demonization are repurposing them. Um, so th that, that's one example from my experience. Um, other questions? In the front, please. Uh, wait for the mic. Yeah, thanks. Um, this has been very interesting. I'm sure this is covered in your book, but could you elaborate on the what we know or don't know about the long-term effects on health of those who get tear gas? 
And secondly, where is that research coming from? Who's funding that research? Or who's not funding that research? Great, I'm sure you can answer as a scientist. I'm sure you can answer that question of who's funding that research. Um, so yeah, um, the one of the only uh, long-term studies, if you can, if you even can, kind of. Uh, call it that, that is not clinical, so that is actually following real people in their real lives, um, is in Palestine, um, and is basically a big cancer doctor in the UK who, probably using some spare grant money or something, um, got some of his like postdocs to go with him to uh, refugee camps where people had lived for a really long time and do so, sorts of try to compile this kind of medical evidence of what had happened over time, over this kind of 20 year and plus period. Um, but as anyone who's related to a medical field in here will know, that kind of science is not very well accepted, either in the scientific community and certainly very hard to mobilize in a kind of larger governmental um, policy kind of base because they want this clinical evidence. Um, and what basically happens is the clinical trials are funded by the military, and so all that science is owned um, by the military. And in one of the chapters in the book, talks about the militarization of science and all these problems with the clinical stuff. Um, and it, basically what happens is that the people that are doing the studies say, oh, no, 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 that's emotional. That, that's because the guy had asthma. That's because of the pre-existing respiratory condition. So they basically take everything that can't be completely precisely proven in a clinical context and just say that it doesn't count. Um, and so it's very, very difficult to do epidemiology or anything that is kind of long-term based or, or looking at sociological factors in, in a study because it gets dismissed um, because of this combination of military science funding, what's accepted as evidence-based policy. So it gets at all of these other much larger problems in, in, in the ways that medical studies kind of happen, but in, in an even more politically fraught context than we have normally for this kind of study. Um, so, so there's also been a little bit of work done on respiratory conditions of people who were, like in Northern Ireland, of people who, who had been tear gassed a lot, and then um, there's this one town that got tear gassed a lot, and a lot of people ended up with respiratory conditions later, but this is again one of those moments where they said, well, that's because they're poor and they smoke too much, right? And so then you can't actually tease out whether or not someone has a respiratory condition because they were repeatedly tear gassed or because they were a smoker, right? So it's, it's a very, very uh, politically fraught and messy kind of um, si scientific uh, question, politics. It's a right for all kinds of collective organizing, I mean, for people to essentially gather testimonies as a, as a form of collective action and resistance to these weapons. Um, <clears throat> you know, sometimes, sometimes it's, it's that kind of knowledge as opposed to the knowledge that's been, um, you know, approved in more, you know, official context that can reach people's hearts, which I guess is part of what that, the, the project that you were working on with the testimonies. But um, has anybody tried to work on something more systematic? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Like, where, where are we? So there was um, a, a doctor in Northern Ireland who passed away recently who um, was really crucial to the kind of peace movement in Northern Ireland. And he, in his later life, started gathering, um, like, testimonies and, and thinking about it in that way. But he was a GP, right? So, and he's working with some clinical doctors, but it's, it's yeah. Um, and, and, and of course, humanitarian organizations are, are constantly documenting these things. Like all the reports that we see from Amnesty and Human Rights Watch are, are through humanitarian documentation. So it's not that we don't have testimony. It's that testimony is not considered data. And data is, but it could be. I mean, this is, I don't know, we don't have enough time for how we turn testimony into data. But um, we are really interested in that idea um, of how we turn testimony into data. Um, but, uh, and then, and so you have, you have this testimony data issue, and then you have all these politics of science of, of the kind of big medical organizations often won't count testimony or that kind of citizen generated science, but it puts pressure on. And, and, and you, you can have, you know, something I talk about in the book is, and, and we see this in, in the um, counting police uh, killings uh, data that was collected here in the US, uh, that bad data is better than no data especially if you can show that your methodology was rigorous and that you've done what you can to try and collect it, and you can put real pressure on organizations. I mean, the fact that The Guardian modeled their data collection after, uh, uh, who was basically a citizen journalist, and now the FBI uses a model generated by The Guardian that was generated by a citizen activist, you know, shows that power of what that kind of aggregated testimony can do. Yeah, I think, um, uh, hello, microphone. 
So, uh, <laughs> I missed you. So, um, there, yeah, there, there was, I think, an evolution, too, in, in since that testimony collecting moment, which now is a few years ago. Um, and then, because we had some people from Chile uh, report, we learned that they actually suspended the use of, of tear gas, I think, for what was like, it was a, a month or two. Yeah, a little while, and it was doctors that had like showed all these harmful effects, but then like almost like tragic comically, they asked CSI, Combined Systems, probably the um, the most famous tear gas company in the world, like, is this really valid testimony? Like the city asked the tear gas manufacturer, and the tear gas manufacturer, no, it's actually it's not that bad. So then they brought it back, I and mean, that's you know it's hilarious. Um, so there's that, but I think, I mean, Mark's point is also very strong because um, the, the challenge in people sharing all these experiences and there is this symbolic solidarity is a little bit uh, like what can it do concretely? How can you have shared targets, coordination globally? It's, it's very difficult. But then there's also kind of like how people do see it as the tip of the iceberg, right? Like in, in Chile, they're trying to nationalize the copper mines so they can pay for universities. In Palestine, it's about like ending the occupation, and now, interestingly, it's the Sulta, it's the PA which is tear gassing people, right? Not just the Israelis. So it just feels like because the politics are so scattered, and the question of how you focus on a particular weapon or a demand, but then don't foreclose the much broader and deeper visions that um, that really like are going to bring back some other kind of repression, even if you do ban this. The landmine campaign, some might say, ended up justifying other weapons because it said this is a non-humane weapon and the others are. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't reduce harm, but at the same time, like that's I think some of the, the, the tension is where in Greece, for example, when Syriza won, they banned tear gas as a government because it was supposedly like a leftist friendly government and that lasted only a little while and, and that they clearly didn't have any of the demands realized of you know, the hopes for that um, different kind of uh, supposedly radical left formation. So I just think, yeah, there's like kind of deeper political questions about abolition and reform, how they can work together productively and, um, and then hopefully kind of sustain these expand, like raising expectations, you know, from banning tear gas to banning tasers to, you know, community control of the police eventually. I think we have time for, that was awesome, by the way. Uh, I think we have uh, time for one more question, so. Don't be shy, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was curious about the use of tear gas in like the carceral context or other kind of more mundane situations that don't maybe operate in the public sphere. Uh, like both about the use, but also about what like its use means in that less visible space. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes the the surgical. I've never heard it um, put that way before, but the, that idea of the surgical. Um, I do talk about the Q-tip incident, but the it's and I think that you get a a mix of that that kind of very personalized, very uh, di directed use in a carceral context, detention centers, schools where these things are used, um, and also right systematic torture. Um, and a reminder of the power dynamic of, of the place, right? And I think that that's where the mass politics of gassing is quite different from the, um, the torture-based application of these. And there's actually some really hor horrific documentation of, um, from the 1920s, of, of, which is, the, and this still goes on, of um, taking tear gas through like a tube and putting it into people's cells. Uh, and so, so this ac actual like further what what sometimes gets called by humanitarian organizations a, a further weaponization of of the weapon, put for the purpose of torture, right? Which which the Q-tip incident is of course uh, as well. Um, and yes, of course, these are much less visible. They only come to surface when basically a journalist decides to cover the fact that it's happened, which usually only happens when abuse gets so bad or a whistleblower comes out, right? So it's incredibly hard to monitor. Um, as any other kinds of abuses in, in prison and detention centers. One of the other things that um, we are kind of trying to monitor a little bit, um, uh, 
but it's also very difficult, is, is the use in ad hoc border regimes. So on these places where we have migration, particularly coming in through, to, through Europe, we have these, there's, there's no like, um, con like a systematic architecture or security system in place. And so people have been using less lethals as a form of border control, as well as a form of torture. So in the refugee camp in Calais, they're like pepper spraying people's sleeping bags so they can't go back and sleep in them um, in these camps. So we see this combination of uh, what the, the aggressive and oppressive use with, uh, like for these kind of purposes of torture with, with this kind of more policing or governance use. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I think we're gonna have to close on behalf of uh, Verso Books and Melville House and Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. I'd like to thank uh, Anna and LA and Mark and Ali for this amazing presentation, this amazing conversation, and Anna for the amazing book, and all of you for coming. Uh, so thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>